Hello and welcome to another lecture. So, today we will be looking at current assets management. So, previously we looked at working capital management and we say this was an important uh, part of the, the financial managers uh, the financial manager's job. So, working capital includes current assets and current liability. The main focus of the financial manager's job would be the current asset aspects of working capital. So today, we are going to focus on the current asset management aspect of working capital management so what are we going to cover what is current asset management in cost benefit analysis cash management marketable securities management of accounts receivables inventory management and here are your learning objectives for you to go through so current asset management so current asset management is controlling and managing the current assets of the firm. It's very time consuming and uh, the job that takes up most of the financial manager's time. It deals with allocating resources among current assets. Current assets usually cash, marketable securities, accounts receivables, inventory. These are the main uh, current assets that it would be managing. It's that it's crucial to the long-term success or the failure of a business because if it's not managed properly and if a company becomes insolvent because there's no cash uh, because it was unable to uh, convert its its other asset, current assets into cash uh, quickly enough it could become a problem or if there is not adequate inventory then that could also become a problem for the business so a cost benefit analysis provides a framework to identify all the resultant uh, changes arising from a decision. So from any decision that a company makes to invest, there would be uh, some resultant changes and a cost benefit analysis must be done to ensure uh, that that uh, decision is resulting in a, a, a positive uh, benefit to the company. So it must consider explicit and implicit costs and benefits. So opportunity costs are implicit ben costs and are foregoing benefits from the next best alternative. So there could be some amount of opportunity costs that are are involved and it, it even it's an implicit cost but it must be considered and, and to see what would be the benefit if an, another alternative um, was chosen for uh, your investment. So example of opportunity costs having uh, capital tied up in current assets are the cost benefits from investing capital in other profitable investment. So good value adding decisions will ensure when the benefits exceed uh, the cost so and if the benefit doesn't exceed the cost then uh, a decision should be made not to continue with that form of investment so in general the return on investment is money received divided by the net capital tied up in this uh, kind of investment so in addition to safety and liquidity. The financial manager must also ensure that the return on current asset must exceed the cost of borrowing or the opportunity cost. So, so the, 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 the financial manager he must consider that the company has to have enough liquidity and that uh, whatever investment is, is safe but also that there must be some uh, positive uh, returns that the company must receive um, from uh, an investment and there should be some uh, explicit cost of the implicit cost of opportunity cost 
should always be considered. So cash management. Um, cash management is important because without cash, the business uh, will not be able to survive. So the, the financial manager must consider maintaining uh, some optimal uh, some optimum level of cash. So there will also be the use of the float, which we will discuss um, later, speed up collections, extend disbursement, and use cash budget. So some these are some of the things that the financial manager will consider in managing its cash. So, the financial manager wants to keep cash balance to a minimum, right? So, you don't want cash balance to be too high, and you don't want cash balance to be too low. If cash balance is too high, then you are holding more cash than you should be holding, and you're missing out and on earnings on those cash that you should be earning. So, if cash balance is too low, then... The possibility of, of defaulting on, on some obligation may occur, which would um, render the company insolvent, and that could become even more problematic. So there are two reasons for holding cash. One, for everyday transactions, and two, for precautionary needs or emergencies. So everyday transaction, um, all the... the, the um, Expenditures that the company will have to carry out, carry out will have to be done. And so company must have adequate amount of cash to do so. But in a time of emergency, company also have to make sure that it has that precautionary uh, cash for that time. So goal to, to, is to speed up the inflow of cash. So in any cash management system, the goal is to speed up the inflow of cash and at the same time, slow down the outflow of cash because that is how you need to have um, more and more cash by speeding up the inflow slowing down the outflow of cash and also um, previously they may attempt to play the, the float the float is not so much um, viable these days uh, which we will uh, look at so the reasons for holding cash balances right so how much to keep in cash first thing how much to keep in cash we have transaction needs cash flow predictability borrowing arrangements and interest rates so these are the things that will help us to determine how much to keep in cash how much transaction does the company need to carry out right if a, a, a retail company may need to make more daily transaction than uh, than a, a manufacturing company so this may determine how much cash transaction does a company need and so how much does it need to hold in cash so cash flow predictability so uh, the, the better company able to predict it cash flow would help in determine how much does it need uh, to hold if, the comp if it's unpredictable, the cash flow, then it may decide that company needs to hold more cash for this unpredictability in its cash flow. Borrowing arrangement. What kind of borrowing arrangement does the company have uh, with a bank, right? If or uh, with any other lending institution, that borrowing arrangement will help to determine uh, how much does the company keep in cash. If it has a, a very flexible borrowing arrangement, then it may not need to hold so much um, because it can go and get when it's needed. But if that's not the case, then it may have to secure its its um, its credit early and ensure that it's able to maintain its cash balance that it's need. <coughs> the cost of, of borrowing is important, so hence interest rate. So what's the cost of borrowing? If, cost, if, if it is cheap, then a company may want to go out and hold on to more cash now, considering that um, it, uh, it may get expensive 
more expensive in the future. So these are some of the things that will help the company to determine if uh, to determine how much cash to keep and this help to keep a safe level in cash invest in uh, so keep safety level in cash and invest the excess so you keep that safety level and then the, in, the excess is in is invested and um, usually if, if this excess that the company may require to use may want to invest in uh, low risk uh, high liquidity investments so like uh, savings money market funds uh, term deposit treasury bills or US uh, deposit so these are some of the options that the company may have to earn small returns of it on its excess funds so collection and disbursement so the cash position and the balance sheet may not portray the actual dollar amount available to the company so there are two important balances um, that the company has to consider one is the corporation's recorded amount so in the ledger account of a corporation whenever it receives a check for example that check is recorded in the ledger amount in the and the ledger account in the corporate uh, head office so in its ledger a cash book it's record uh, a check for example as it's received for a thousand dollars the amount available for use uh, by the corporation at the bank so the, at the bank the bank has an account for the corporation in which it records the amount that the corporation deposited or withdrawn from the bank so these two amounts may be different uh, the difference between the two is what is called the float so here it, let's look at an example so corporate bank book may say one thousand dollars initial uh, invest uh, amount deposited uh, the initial amount then the deposits of a million dollars and then checks drawn on the on the uh, corporate bank may be nine hundred thousand so the corporate bank uh, cash book or its ledger account is showing two hundred thousand uh, dollars at the balance while at the bank the the same initial amount was there for hundred thousand but it's only showing eight hundred thousand in deposits because some of that deposit may not have been um, sent to the bank as yet so it has not yet been processed by the bank so not being processed uh, by the bank so also that even though the, the company has drawn nine hundred thousand dollars in checks it's only the bank has only received four hundred thousand dollars of those checks some of those checks may still be in the mail some of those checks may be with the company uh, with the the companies or the individual that those checks were sent to and they have not yet been processed so because they have not yet been processed they have not yet received by the bank hence there is a difference between the bank account amount and the corporate uh, account amount and so the difference between the two in this case 300,000 is what would be considered as plain the float so here's another example again you can see that the initial amount is the same in both um, in both the corporate account and the bank book so the deposit of one million dollars was made into the corporate uh, uh, bank book about uh, corporate's account in its office its ledger and uh, checks uh, drawn was 1.2 million so the balance uh, was uh, down by one hundred thousand dollars in at the bank it was eight hundred thousand that was uh, deposited and you can see that the checks john was also eight hundred thousand uh, uh, dollars so 
the difference between the two one has negative 100,000 and the other has a positive 100,000 the difference between the two 200,000 is what would be called plain the float so the company would be able uh, to use this $200 um, as if it has uh, $200,000 available to it. So that's how the float is, is uh, what's called within the float. So improving collection and extending disbursement. So having monies in a bank account one day longer can make a significant difference, right? Uh, you can earn interest on that money and depends on how much is it. It could be a good um, chunk of earnings. So making payments to local offices with checks deposit at local branches. So that's one way you could actually increase it by making these payments to local offices. So rather than the company, rather than sending checks all the way from BC to Toronto, Checks could actually be lodged at local offices in, in, in BC and then the account is updated in Toronto. You could also have regional collection center. So we could have one for, for Atlantic Canada and one for, for Western Canada, a regional center that would receive these checks and make and process them. So as to reduce that time that checks will travel in the mail from from BC or Atlantic Canada to Toronto. Again, it could also use a lockbox system when customers mail payments to the local uh, post office instead of the company's headquarters. Somebody then clear those local checks and make those those deposits again so that uh, to reduce that traveling time of, of checks. So there's improvement in the collection uh, using electronics fund transfer and electronics data exchange. So now we have payments are made almost immediately. They are uh, the updating of accounts almost immediately and um, transfer of payment from one customer to uh, another are uh, for between um, between one company and another and all of these would reduce the time that the, the traveling uh, reduce it, the use of checks and reduction in the use of checks uh, would also uh, reduce the, the, the opportunity for the company to actually play the float so the improvement in all this um, data transfer and, um, and electronics uh, funds transfer well, is, is um, reducing the opportunity for companies to play the float and of course they have the use of debit cards and and, and pre-authorized checks and all these would be um, how customers can sometimes pay uh, their their uh, their bills or pay the company and it uh, also reduces that time and, and improve the, the time that a company will have its cash available to it, but it also reduces the opportunity to play uh, the float, but, um, it, and it's also one other aspect of what the company, the, the bank has uh, as um, service to charge. So a system where payments are automatically deducted from the bank account is um, the where you know, the use of the debit card and the pre-authorization checks and so on. Okay, so let's do a cash management analysis. So using a, a cost benefit uh, analysis, we may decide whether to set up a new cash uh, management system or not. So assume that the benefits it would be to if a company has um, average uh, collection of say two million dollars and it's able to speed that up by 1.5 days so it's able to collect uh, uh, it's have an average collection of two million dollars a day and it's able to speed up that collection by 1.5 days and that would translate into three million dollars uh, uh, that it could actually 
be able to um, find itself with as uh, additional um, uh, cash. While at the same time, if it's able to reduce the time, if it's able to extend the time by one day of paying its, its, its suppliers and paying its creditors, if it can extend that time by one day, and then it could have as a, a gain average of two million dollars available to it um, for uh, by 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 being able to delay that payment. So that could be amount of three million uh, five million dollars by just uh, speeding up the collection uh, by a day and at the same by one point five day and reducing the and, and extending the, the disbursement time by a day it's able to make available to it an average of five million dollars more uh, annually so the opportunity benefit at four percent of interest earned so on the freed up funds would then be two hundred thousand dollars and if it's value of this more timely information so let's say that the banks is going to give it some more timely information that will help it if it valued that at say forty thousand dollars to be added to this two hundred thousand to give you two hundred and forty thousand dollars of the values that it would receive from putting in this cash management system that um uh, that the bank will helps with now the bank will charge a fee of say fifteen thousand uh, dollars to do this fifteen thousand dollars a month that fifteen thousand dollars a month would then be a hundred and eighty thousand dollars per year so what is the benefit to the company the net benefit would therefore be fifty uh, two hundred and forty minus one sixty and a total of sixty so two hundred and forty minus one eighty to be a total of sixty thousand dollars net benefit that the company could actually receive So a cash management network, it could have local offices and all these local offices will have their local branches that which they could then make deposit. And this uh, could then be updated into the company's central bank account, um, doing so from all these different uh, local branches. So uh, the system could be that uh, it, it reduced remittance time by one and a half days by putting in the system while at the same time where uh, by dispersing um, all checks from headquarters rather than from uh, branches but from the headquarters then it could actually increase the disbursement time by one day using what's known as distant disbursement uh, using the distant disbursement center uh, which probably located say in the corporate head office so uh, the, between the reduction of the remittance time and the increase in disbursement time we'll have 2.5 days worth of cash to free the fund with an average of of two million dollars movement per day then company could find uh, five million available uh, funds now let's look at marketable securities. So marketable securities are securities that can easily be converted into cash. So when company has excess cash um, that they will need in short term, they, uh, they usually put them in uh, short term securities, which are usually called marketable securities because they are usually being able to quickly convert it into cash and sometimes so we speak of cash and cash equivalent, which usually cash equivalents are uh, like marketable securities because uh, they are easily converted into cash. So factors to consider in choosing um, these securities would be the yield. How much would you be able to make on this uh, security if an investment was made in this security? Maturity. Will there be a, a maturity time or would it be a, an on-demand? So whenever you need it, you can go take it. Or is it that there's a maturity period? Because if there's a maturity period and then you are going to make an investment and if you're going to put cash that will be needed into this um, investment, 
but the maturity period would be beyond the time that you would require the funds, then that could become a problem. So it, uh, maturity would have to be considered in minimum investment required. What well, is there a minimum amount that would be uh, required? Are, are there even not just a minimum, but um, it could be that an investment of say 10,000 would have received a different rate which would mean a different yield from an investment of say $25,000. So that would also be considered. The safety of the investment. How safe is this investment that the company um, put the company's money in? How, uh, is it relatively safe? Is it um, taking uh, too much risk? So the safety is important. Marketability. How, how quickly can we actually convert this security into cash uh, how quickly can we sell this uh, security uh, its market ability of, of it would have to be considered so the yield and marketable securities if marketable uh, securities are usually uh, it's uh, on, sold on a discount basis so it's usually sold on a discount basis which means that um, that the return is usually the difference between the price paid and the maturity value. So the price paid is usually um, uh, discounted from the maturity uh, value. So for example, if the maturity value is 100, then minus the price paid divided by the price paid and to get the annualized amount, we would take 365 days divided by the number of days that that security is out that that, that you're actually holding on to that security so in making investments it's also important to consider uh, the yield because long-term long-term maturity tends to have higher yield than shorter maturity and as we can see here that if you look at the treasury bills that are usually a money market instrument or a short term instrument you can see that the yield tends to be much less than the yield that would receive from say a government bond that's a longer term security but even though a government bond will provide a better yield it is important to consider what time frame are you looking at in terms of the investment because it, you could make an investment into a government bond and then uh, because the money is needed uh, much earlier than uh, you would actually like to that you actually have to, to to take a discount because of changing interest rate to um, for the price of uh, marketing that security so it's important to consider um, the time frame in which the money will be needed as well as what is uh, the interest uh, what would be the yield on that investment so here is a hierarchy of money market instruments and the rates that uh, that say was available uh, in 1990 the yield and versus say 2017 and we can see here that the, the, the best rate is usually um, prime rate which would give what the, the banks would say give to their best customers and um, in 2017 that yield was 2.7% uh, percent compared to say 14.25% in 1990. Now secondly you have the bank rate uh, which is the Bank of Canada rate to the banks are, are, are dealers and this rate is only yielding 0.5% in 2017 compared to 13.38% in 2000 and in 1990. So then we have a, a commercial uh, paper which is a corporate uh, 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 paper usually issued by corporate companies and they say have a maturity of three months and the minimum amount would be say a hundred thousand dollars is that safety of it 
It's uh, fairly okay, but it depends on the corporate companies. But it's only usually very established uh, companies that are able to use commercial paper anyway. So uh, it's safe to maybe relatively quick. Cool. And it's fairly marketable, so the ability to sell it is high. So converting that into cash would be important. And the yield on that would be 0 0.85. Um, in 2017. So we have a number of them here that you can go through and look at the different yield and the different uh, maturity dates, uh, marketability and, and so on. One of the things that we must consider in making all these would be transaction costs because transaction costs could turn uh, a positive investment into a negative investment. So what would be the cost of, of converting one security, of selling a security, for example, um, what, what's the transaction cost involved in that? So that is also important in considering and making our decision. So management of accounts receivable. So accounts receivable is, is um, the ability to sell our the stock or our goods on, on credit. This will allow a company to increase its sales and become even more profitable. But in making uh, this decision, you're actually making an investment into accounts receivable. So in making an, an investment into accounts receivable, a, a company must consider what's a benefit of making this um, investment. So trade credit facilitate sales. Right, so trade credit is an effective financing source for a small firm as they lack access to capital markets or bank financing, and uh, we, I think we'll look at that in our next uh, lecture on a more uh, extensive uh, basis. So, accounts receivable should be deemed as an investment, so the return on this current asset should be compared with direct cost of borrowing or the opportunity costs of investing in other assets so if here for example if our accounts receivable is building up it, even though you receive in a 10 percent return on accounts receivable but um, it means that you have to forego an eight percent um, return in marketable securities or uh, a 12 percent increase uh, return on inventory or it could be that it comes at a cost where um, you have to uh, accounts receivable being built up more, uh, accounts payable, sorry, being built up more, and that may be a cost of seven dollars at seven point five percent. Or it could be that a bank loan is required, and that could be at a cost of say seven percent. So those are some of the, the things that we have to take into account when accounts receivable is built is is being built up what is what what's the return on this uh, uh investment versus the return on other investment or the cost that we may have to incur to make the investment in accounts receivable so credit and uh, in, in giving credit uh to a company company uh to, to customers, company must consider, uh, must have some credit uh, uh, policy. And there are three primary policy variables to consider in conjunction with, of course, other profit uh, objectives are, as we have credit standard, terms of collection, and collection uh, uh, policy. So credit standards, uh, is a, a credit risk analysis uh, related to four uh, C's of credit. So in setting up your credit standard, you have to consider uh, these four C's of credit. One is character, is customer willingness to pay. So, I mean, if, if there is difficulty, if this company is going through a difficult period or this customer is going through a difficult period, how willing would this customer uh, be to work out uh, a deal 
with the company to ensure that it pays its bill. So you would uh, uh, probably get information from other suppliers. Um, are this com is this company having legal issues or union problems? So these, some of this information would help to determine um, the, the willingness of the company to pay. And how much is this company willing to provide information? Just even, just as simple as that. If uh, are they um, honest, willing to provide information? As all this will help in determining the company's uh, willingness to pay. The capacity or uh, the ability to pay. So is it, is the company Bob? past profit and its future profit. Is it a profitable company? Is it expected to make profit in the future? Um, does it have good management? All of these would determine, uh, would help determine its, its ability to, to pay. So capital, um, is it a well capitalized company? So assets and its network, you would have to, to, to consider in, in, in this case. So, is it is it assets growing? Is its debt low? So these are some of the things that you would consider. How how uh, and and it will come back down really to uh, to proper management. Uh, how is this company well managed? And conditions, the state of the economy and the industry. Uh, how much would that impact on this customer and other customers? And how customers adapt to these changes in condition? are some of the things you will consider in making uh, that decision on your, your credit standard. So terms of trade. So the length of time credit is granted and whether discount is allowed. Set different credit period to increase sales. So you, you may set different credit period to increase sales and you may have um, and you may have a different credit period to different companies depending on how important the, the customer is to you, or how, or, or how, um, how well this company has been able to manage its its business, so you're you're comfortable in extending, say, thirty days uh, rather than fifteen uh, a fifteen day period to this customer because you know that this customer uh, will pay. So, so you offer different credit terms also to encourage payments for example 2-10 comma net 30 so what this is saying is that a company will pay will will pay um if pay in 10 days you can get two percent discount otherwise you pay full in 30 days so it's enabled the customer to obtain a two percent discount if the invoice is paid within 10 days if not, the full amount is payable within 30 days. And we will look at this further in our next um, uh, lecture. And you will see that it is an important uh, part of, of, um, of companies uh, uh, securing uh, credit. So collection uh, a policy, it's established collection procedures to obtain payment from delinquent accounts in a timely and regular manner and, um, it, and, and it's based on average collection period. So the average collection period is, uh, it really tells you how quickly is the company collecting its, 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 its debt. Now is this lengthening or is it the same? Is it because if it's increasing it means that the company may not be doing such a good job in 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 making these uh, collection so that would have to be um, adjusted uh, uh, to manage properly so the ratio of bad debt uh, to credit sales so is is it so is that ratio of bad debt low and if it is low is it increasing or is are you able to maintain that ratio of bad debt because if that ratio starts to increase then that could say that some some uh, bad decisions are being made about who to give credit to because more more uh, bad debt, more persons are actually uh, more companies, more customers are finding themselves with uh, with bad debt. So it's important to consider the ratio of bad debt to credit sales, and of course aging of co of accounts receivable, which is 
uh, pretty similar to average uh, collection period. Is the accounts receivable age? Uh, is it is it most of it over, uh, say, 45 days, 60 days, or is it much closer to to, to 30 days? So the aging of the accounts receivable is also important. So let's look at an example of uh, a credit decision where the company would say it's making the decision to sell on credit and that sales and credit would actually increase uh, by its overall sales by say 10% from 100,000 uh, 100, to 110,000. So we can clearly project that for if we have our current situation here in terms of sales and uh, in terms of those on, uh, increased sales, what would project sales to 110,000. And of course, a cost of goods sold uh, would maintain the same ratio, so it would be 73,700. It could then produce a profit margin, and if we apply uh, the same 10% to sell an expense, then it would be uh, uh, 11,000. Um, bad debt, if um, I believe that the, that then it may be that this could um, in, be rather risky. So bad debt may be say ten percent of uh, of that sales, which would then mean that sales would uh, bad debt would then be projected to be say eleven thousand dollars, and the collection expense, of course. Uh, at, uh, assume that there will be a 5% collection expense. So we could find all of these here um, in terms of just doing our normal income as a statement. However, other costs may be elusive, in particular, in particularly opportunity costs that may arise if a firm commits, say, to a new uh, credit policy. So um, if a firm make the decision to invest in, in more um, accounts receivable um, so as to increase its sales, and in this example, the incremental sales was uh, 10,000, and it, it gives us an incremental contribution margin of, say, 3,300, and we know that the selling uh, incremental selling expense ten it was a thousand, and the incremental bad debt was also a thousand, and there was a, an incremental cost uh, collection cost of five hundred. So what was not uh, so clear would be uh, the uh, incremental accounts uh, receivable uh, costs, uh, the opportunity costs uh, of making this investment in accounts receivable. So that we we could find by uh, looking at uh, the sales amount of ten thousand, and to see what amount of accounts receivable that would uh, be translated in. So as you can see here, that if a company um, is expected to have a receivable. A turnover of six times a year, then that if we divide uh, the incremental receivable by six, it will give us our sales um, to turnover of one six six uh, seven, right? And we know that from that, therefore, the incremental uh, cost would be fifteen percent. And therefore, the investment in accounts receivable would worth two hundred and fifty dollars. So, the total incremental change would therefore result in a profitable amount of say five hundred and fifty dollars. Now, let's look at inventory management. So inventory is divided into three uh, categories. We have raw materials, so you have raw material inventory, you have work in progress inventory, 
R and finish quotes and then we have finish quotes inventory so there are three basic uh, types of, of inventory that uh, we can have so there are two basic costs associated with inventory one is order and cost and two is carrying cost so order and cost is ordering delivering the inventory taking it uh, uh, to the warehouse for example while carrying cost is is the cost of keeping that inventory until it is being used and that cost include things like insurance so optimal level of inventory will satisfy customers demand and production requirement while minimizing cost and uh, ordering and carrying costs so let's talk a little about labor versus seasonal production so uh, previously we talked about uh, labor production right where the same amount is produced every every month for example we talked about that in one of our previous lectures so producing the same amount each month would be labor production inventory costs are generally high because in period when times are low the production continues so that carrying cost of inventory would be relatively higher so operating costs though would be lower because they're able to spread that operating cost over uh, a longer uh, period now with seasonal production producing a different amount each month is um, would be what that is so we're producing a different amount each month and inventory costs are generally lower because during the period when sales are down then uh, production will be down and hence um, a less amount of inventory to carry um, operating costs though would be higher because during period of high demand then you'd have to employ over time and so on so uh, uh, operating costs would be higher in that case so order and invention how much do you uh, order at one time it would depends on the forecast of sales so how much would you need to use or uh, uh, it could be the forecast uh, the usage so not necessarily sale it depends on the kind of uh, inventory that we are talking about so the cost of placing and receiving those orders inventory carrying costs and the economies of scale are are we able to to, to do large scale uh, production or purchase uh, this in large scale because it could mean uh, a, a lower unit cost so inventory uh, carrying costs uh, we have to deal with the storage costs insurance costs financing costs to finance uh, uh, the, the inventory uh, which we also looked at in you know, one of our previous tutorials shortage uh, damages that may arise and uh, we have to deal with the writing of absolutely goods so it's important to consider um, is these goods time sensitive and then we have ordering cost which would be the purchasing of the goods uh, the whole uh, system that's set up to purchase and to take goods in-house and receiving of those goods all of this would be considered in the carrying cost so in determining the optimal level of inventory right, we have those two costs that we have to uh, to deal with and at one hand your ordering costs will, will be reduced as the company orders more on the other hand its carrying costs will increase as the company uh, carry more 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 inventory so where the two meets is usually what determines our minimum uh, that determines our optimum level of in inventory so as uh, you can see here that we have a total cost line as is at the top of a total cost curve that the minimum amount m which would be at the uh, the minimum point on this curve here and it's also where our carrying cost uh, line meets our order and cost curve and in this case it optimal amount would be 400 uh, units so economic order quantity and economic order quantity 
where it will be the optimal best amount for the firm to order each time. So it occurs at the low point M on the total cost curve and the, and the order size where total carrying cost is equal to total ordering cost and if we assume there's no safety stock. So economic ordering quantity. So carrying cost which is interest and funds tied up in inventory, cost of warehouse space, insurance, premium and material handling expense, implicit costs associated with the risk of obsolescence and uh, uh, perishable uh, ability. And then we have ordering costs, which are cost of ordering, cost of processing inventory in, in stock. So formula for economic order quantity would be at the square root of 2SO over C, where S would be the total sales in unit, O would be ordering cost for each order, and C would be carrying cost per unit in dollars. So if we if we're assuming uh, based on our previous example that uh, that sales would be two thousand and then and if we have uh, a carrying cost per unit of twenty cents then we can see that we could actually calculate the number of units to be four hundred units. So economic order quantity, the total inventory costs uh, are given by TC equal to S over Q plus CQ over 2, where S is, again, total sales in unit, O is ordering cost for each unit, uh, C is the carrying cost per unit in dollars, and Q will be the quantity per order. Now, safety stock. So safety stock is that extra inventory the firm keeps in stock in case of unforeseen problems. So minimum level of inventory um, uh, uh, planned and uh, designed to minimize stock, stock out. So the company would therefore ensure that it would not be running out of stock and, and, um, and having to tell its customers that it cannot supply them. The management decision is based on risk of stock or desired level of service that a company wants to be delivered. So does the company want to find itself into a place where it never wants to tell customers that um, doesn't have it available. So that's a desired level of service and at that desired level of service it may need to carry that um, so a certain amount of safety stock to ensure it can maintain that desired level of service. So, assuming that the average inventory, uh, of course, would be the economic order quantity, right? Divide by two, that would be the average inventory. And if we add the safety stock uh, to that, so average inventory would therefore becomes, uh, the, becomes the economic order quantity, and in our case was 400, divided by two, and to that we will add a safety stock of say uh, 50. So inventory carrying cost will now increase by uh, by $50. So as you can see, um, it's equal to average so carrying cost of average carrying cost in units multiplied by the carrying cost per unit. So it would be uh, 250 multiplied by 0.2 to give uh, 50 dollars. So just in time is another form of inventory system we can use to manage our inventory. In, and in just in time inventory system, uh, the common features are like the minimum level of inventory. So it will not carry a uh, huge inventory level, but a, a minimum amount. So orders in very uh, in small lot sizes. So the amount that is ordered are generally small computerized order and inventory system so that um, as soon as an order is is is, uh, is needed it can be uh, quickly be sent to the, the supplier uh, electronic data interchange between say supplier and the company uh, short delivery time so within a day for example the, the 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 supplier may be able to supply the 
the um, needed inventory small number of suppliers so you have a number of suppliers so that work with it may be a small number of them but it's also they are so reliable and um, quality control uh, program so because of the short time span between um, when between order the company has to ensure that that, that some quality control uh, program is in place to ensure that the order um, is that the the inventory quality is maintained and that the company doesn't uh, find itself into a situation where it, it's its quality is uh, is poor and it's it's not and it doesn't have the inventory now it has to go wait and uh, a company to remanufacture to manufacture a new uh, set of of um, inventory or to get a new set in a new amount uh, of inventory in because this could mean uh, problematic for the company so uh, hence there must be some quality control program so uh, potential benefits of this would be uh, lower carrying costs automatic um, ordering fewer accounting errors lower quality control costs and elimination of, of waste so those are some of the benefits from using a just-in-time inventory uh, uh, system and this system I think was developed by by Toyota um, back in in Japan and um, it's now being used uh, in many companies uh, uh, throughout uh, the world so in conclusion current assets represent a sizable investment so firm should apply the cost benefit analysis to allocate financial resources among cash marketable securities accounts receivables and inventory in cash management the firm should try to keep the balance just adequate for transaction and compensating purposes the firm should keep should speed up cash collection and extend cash uh, disbursement so excess short-term funds should be placed in marketable securities so whatever excess fund you have you should place it in marketable securities because it can earn uh, a small amount but it will be able to earn some amount of interest on it so accounts receivable facilitate the sales at the same time it also an investment to of the firm so management of accounts receivable calls for determining credit standard and the form of credit to be offered as well as development development of an alternative of an effective collection of policy firms management inventory managing inventory using such techniques as economic order quantity and just in time model so here we have it um, we have just uh, completed our lecture in current asset management and so i will see you in the tutorial